Let's turn in your Sing the Journey book, please. Sing the Journey to number 112. I'm making a slight switch here. Uh, we're going to sing I Owe My Lord a Morning Song instead of I Owe the Lord a Morning Song. I was thinking they were the same one, but they're not. This is the one I was hoping for. It's a, a fresh one um, and one that I like from the, the Sing the Journey book. Uh, we couldn't get all of them into the new book, so uh, this one's the one that I like. Um, apparently, maybe you don't know this as well, though, so we're going to let uh, Stephanie play it through for us once, and let's stand. Sorry, 112. 112 and sing the journey. Good morning and welcome to this worship service. This is a rich weekend in our church family. Yesterday was full of joy and sadness mingled. I don't know if I've been that elated after a funeral service and that sad at the same time. Remarkable. And just for the record, Janet never had that long a problem with her grade seven class to get them quiet. <laughs> Lent is a season of introspection. It's a time to think deeply about our connections to God, to each other, and to the world around us. The passion story strikes us deeply. The betrayals, doubt, wavering of faith and understanding, and profound changes in the followers of Jesus have us possibly comparing ourselves to the main characters of the story. In this season, 
many of us feel particularly vulnerable. Today, we focus on Thursday of the Holy Week, the day of the Last Supper. We have an opportunity to, dent to identify with the disciples around the table at the Last Supper. The religious authorities are waiting and watching they want to put an end to Jesus and his followers. Because the disciples know that one of them will betray Jesus, the evening is full of drama. Furtive glances, I'm sure, awkward eye contact, careful attention to each other's speech and demeanors, and undoubtedly fear that their world is about to drastically change. Of course, we know the rest of the story, the story of Easter Sunday and the following time of hope and wonder. But the compelling story of Christ's last days as a human gives us a yearly struggle. We have the privilege to wrestle with Lenten issues together as a loving, caring community. We thank God for this morning, and we thank God for each one of us. Our opening prayer is an adaptation of a prayer found in Voices Together, number 1035. Let's bow together. Loving God, we know our hands are the hands with which you do your work. Ours are the feet with which you walk the earth. Through our eyes, your compassion shines on a troubled world. Help us stay centered as we make our way through Lent and help us live our lives in ways that echo the life of Christ. Amen. Number 101 in Voices Together this time. Number 101, Voices Together, sing praise to God who reigns above. Let's stand. Sing praise to God.
It's time for our children's story. Would children please come forward at this time? You can just sit down. just going to take a minute to get out my special amazing props. I made this myself. <laughs> Today we will hear the story about a man with the water jug. The story is a little mysterious, maybe a little strange. Sometimes, unless we think it through, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So listen for the reasons that this story actually does make sense. Our story this morning begins with the first day of Passover. Have you heard the word Passover before? Yeah. Passover has been established by Jews and they celebrate it every year. They've done it for a long time. It's a time when people remember and they celebrate and they share a special meal. They remember that God saved the Israelites from being slaves in Egypt. On the very last day that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God gave Moses a message for the Israelites. Moses told the Israelites to put a mark on the outside of their houses in the evening, and then they were to stay inside until morning. In the morning, many people in Egypt had died, but the people whose houses were marked were passed over and saved. God protected the Israelites, and death passed over them that night. This is where the Passover meal celebration began. Jesus and his friends wanted to share a special Passover meal on Thursday night. It was Thursday afternoon, and Jesus told two of the disciples to go to Jerusalem and prepare for it. At first I thought, what are two guys going to do preparing for all those other people? But then I thought, uh, the owner of the house they were in had lots of servants, so they probably didn't have to have hot dogs. <laughs> how many disciples did Jesus have? Does anyone know how many disciples Jesus had? Twelve. Yes, the twelve disciples. But he only sent two of them to find the house that they were going to have the meal and to prepare that meal. And he didn't even tell the two disciples where the supper would be. Instead, he told them to walk into Jerusalem, a pretty big city, and when they got there, they'd see a man carrying a jug. It was a cool jug. Possibly on his head. As you can see, this man has on his head. It looks like a barrel, but it's a jug. The two disciples were supposed to find the house where they could have the Passover meal. So the two disciples did exactly what Jesus said. They followed a man that they met at the outskirts of the city, and this man led them to where the owner of the house showed them a big room upstairs where they could celebrate the Passover meal. The two disciples went about the work of gathering the meal for Jesus and all the other disciples. We know that Jesus wanted the place of, Paso the pl the place of the Passover meal to be the very last supper with his disciples and he wanted it to be a secret. 
It was important that it would be a secret because there were many people who wanted to capture Jesus and they wanted to do away with him because they were very worried about his message. In this story, there are some things that maybe make us wonder. For instance, what does it mean to betray someone? If you would betray someone, what would you do? Yeah. Yes, that's an excellent answer. Someone that might trust you might do something to hurt you, maybe using some information. For instance, if my friend secretly told me that he's afraid of the dark, but I didn't keep his secret and told a bunch of his friends and my friends, I would have betrayed my friend. Who was the person that Jesus knew was going to betray him. Do you remember his name? Judas. Judas. Jesus knew. Did the other disciples know? No. Even at the Last Supper, Jesus just said, one of you will betray me. It's the guy with his hand on the table, he said, so I'm sure a lot of hands quickly went off the table. <laughs> Sending 12 disciples might look a little suspicious to the authority, authorities who were looking for Jesus. So this is what I envisioned in Legoland would be the look. Two guys who were kind of secretly, nonchalantly following the guy with a water jug. And here's the authority on a horse, just not noticing them because it's two guys walking down the street and there was a guy with a water jug. Here's the alternative. One of my trees fell off. Twelve disciples with Jesus in their midst, following a guy with a water jug. A slightly different scene, don't you think? Maybe even noticeable in the narrow streets of Jerusalem. Jesus, if Jesus had sent all 12 disciples to find the house, Judas would have known where it was, and he could have told the authorities. Before Jesus was captured, and he knew he was going to be captured, he wanted time and a last meal with his disciples. Why do you think Jesus arranged to have a man with a water jug waiting for him instead of the owner of the house? Kind of a weird question, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the man with the water bucket didn't draw much attention, exactly. The owner of the house was probably known by the authorities, by the leaders in the community. He was a friend of Jesus, obviously, and People were watching. So they might have been watching his house. They might have been watching for him. But it was Passover, and a guy was going out with a water jug. There's lots of conjecture about that, too, but we won't get into that. If just two men were following a servant, it would look less suspicious. So Jesus' plan to get the house ready for the Last Supper was a pretty good one. Shortly after the supper, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And Jesus was captured by soldiers and taken to jail. So they had the Last Supper. Later in this service, you can listen for it, Pastor Don is going to tell us more about the Last Supper. Many years ago, Leonardo da Vinci painted this picture. It was his imagination capturing what he thought the Last Supper would look like. A bunch of guys on one side of a table. <laughs> I, I wonder if that was the way it really happened, but that's how, that's how he imagined it. Um, just a little point of interest, we now believe that the table was probably really, really close to the floor, 
and the disciples were probably sitting on cushions around the floor eating. So this Last Supper is maybe not completely accurate. But that's just something to think about. You can use your own imaginations as we talk about the Last Supper and wonder what the picture you would draw of it would be like. And you can wonder what the people were thinking, what the disciples were thinking, having a supper with Jesus that they didn't really know would be the Last Supper and wondering which one of us is going to betray Jesus. Could it be me and I don't even know? It's quite a dynamic time. Thanks for listening. You can go back to your seats. Our first of two scripture passages this morning comes from Mark 14, 17 to 19. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, surely not I. The second is from Luke 22, 15 to 23. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. Yesterday morning, we assembled the Harder Neufeld family in the gathering room and it was fun to be there to watch the energy and excitement. This was a reunion for many of them. They had come from different places across Canada and US and were excited to see each other but also carrying the weight of this loss. And uh, the family dynamics were fun. And, and it was an opportunity to take a picture. And so, Arrangements were made, people were organized, and it looked up like a beautiful picture. People were smiling, people were honored in that picture. And I thought, what? you know, Jesus is having a last supper now with his 12. What kind of picture? Wouldn't they want something similar, where everyone is excited and happy to be there? Well, that's not exactly the the conditions or, or the uh, context, right? This is the painting that Chuck was showing the children, a version of it. It was actually done by Leonardo da Vinci in, uh, it took him three years to do it on the wall in a monastery, and I think it was a dining room. And it was probably similar to this size, maybe a little bit bigger yet. Notice, 
this, this picture is created the moment Jesus says, one of you will betray me. So it's capturing reactions. Now you might wonder, who is who in this picture? The internet supplies the answer. <laughs> Next slide, Larry. It's helpful to, I found it helpful to kind of picture and then maybe understand some of the visuals or, or responses. Let's zoom in on some of these. Next, yeah. Bartholomew, James the Minor, and Andrew. What do you think they are feeling? What is their reaction here? Bartholomew looks a bit angry. Couldn't be. This couldn't be. Uh, Andrew? Oh my goodness. James? Frozen. Greatly distressed. They asked each other, am I the one? Let's look at the next group of three. Interesting that Leonardo paints Judas and Peter side by side. One could imagine something going on there. Judas is leaning back, a bit aghast that Jesus pointed him out, that he knows the plan. Peter, leaning on John, asking him, tell me who it is. I'll kill him. And John, interestingly, someone thought, Possibly he could be interpreted as a female, not Mary, had to be clarified there. I think it's kind of cool that Leonardo painted John with feminine characteristics, perhaps recognizing that John, was, or this John, was the one who would feel this deeply in the heart, something women are maybe more gifted at emotional connectivity, and so forth. Next slide. On the other side of the table, we have Thomas. Hold it, I have a question. <laughs> and we've got James. Wow, you know, what, is, what do those open arms mean? Jesus, this can't be true. Philip? Oh boy. Was Philip the one who said nothing good could come out of Nazareth? Maybe he's pondering, wow, nothing good can come out of me either. You caught me, Jesus. You caught how I feel, how I don't fully believe you. I still have doubts. Next one. Well, there's Matthew and Thaddeus looking for someone to explain it. Simon, you're the old guy here at the table. <laughs> what? How could this be? You must know something. And he's, I don't. I don't know what this means. Next. So Jesus has announced that one of them will betray him. That's crushing to know that. And yet he says, I am very eager to eat this meal with you. I want to be here, even though one of you will betray me. In fact, you're all going to run away. <laughs> you're, some of you are going to deny me that you ever knew me, but I very eagerly have wanted to eat this meal with you. That to me just seems stunningly opposite. Next, Larry. Is it Paul that's in, in Romans that says if you if you have an enemy that you should feed him? Jesus is choosing to feed his enemies. Yes, they're his disciples, but they are betrayers. 
He's going to wash their feet. Next. Just imagine them all getting in touch with their elements of disloyalty. And here he wants to get so intimately close with them that he wants to wash their feet. This has got to be hugely awkward. Next. I love it in this story that Jesus doesn't out Judas. If he had, I bet the other 11 would have just piled on. But because he doesn't directly indicate who will betray him, they're all wondering. They're all getting in touch with the things that they haven't been able to reconcile and that they are not fully on board with. Next. I, I feel like they're... By, by saying, all, one of you will betray me and stirring the pot, they're all getting in touch with what is not perfect in their life, in their relationship with Jesus. And yet, they have heard Jesus say, I want you to be perfect like my Father in heaven is perfect. Part of the Sermon on the Mount. Next slide. But if you check that out, and I think I've told you about this once before, and maybe Mark and Janet have too, it's worth repeating. That word that the NIV translates in as perfect really means complete. I want you to be complete. Like all the pieces of who you are on the table put together. I want you to come as you are the whole of you to this meal that I have eagerly wanted to eat with you. We can come complete even with our, the hard things that we have not been able to reconcile about this way of, of life that Jesus has introduced. Next. In essence, Jesus is asking us to come as a, like a child would, fully complete, nothing hidden back. Yesterday at the graveside, when we lowered Gary's body into the ground, we, we sang two songs, and one was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. It was a great-granddaughter, right, Mark, who wanted to have that sung. Michelle Rizzoli, uh, who was the preacher at the service a little later, I had her in my van. We were driving back from the graveside to the church. And she said, Don, I was fine <laughs> throughout that graveside service until we sang Twinkle, Twinkle. <laughs> and that's when the tears came. The last piece of the picture got put into place, the, the feelings of, of tenderness. It's beautiful. You and I can be that child. And so we want to come to this meal as we are, with all the pieces of who we are, with our questions, with our imperfections. Jesus invited his friends, his disciples, to not hold anything back and to be fully present as they were in their doubts and frustrations and whatever. May we each come to this table trusting that God's grace will cover even those parts that we'd like to hide. Amen. Number 465 in your hymnal, Prepare a Room for Me, uh, is a beautiful piece that talks about so many of the things that you just heard right now. Let's stand and sing together.
During Lent, we have journeyed with Jesus through the last week of his life. And all along the way, we heard him calling us to the non-violent, non-threatening, non-coercive way of shalom, calling us to choose the things that make for peace. And now Jesus is inviting us to join him at the table. Jesus said, I have eagerly, eagerly desired to eat this meal with you. His table of welcome and grace is before us. The meal is ready, and the friends, the friends of Jesus are gathered. In sharing the bread and the cup, we are joined together in a circle of faith and love and trust in the overflowing grace of God. And we commit ourselves to walking in the way of Jesus and to seeking the things that make for peace. So this morning, instead of sitting in a straight line, <laughs> we will share communion in three circles, again at the front of the church like we did a month and a half ago. And we invite you to come forward in groups of about 12 to 15 people around each circle. There are three small tables at the front. And if it's easier for you to sit while you're in that circle, there are some chairs and, and benches if that's helpful for you. Bread will be passed around on a cloth, and you can take off a piece for yourself and then pass the bread on to the next person to do the same. And there is a gluten-free option at each circle. When all have been served, we will eat together as a circle. And then the pastors will bring around the communion tray to your circle to serve each person, and then we can drink together as a circle. And when one group is done, another circle can form and come forward. So you don't need to stand in the aisles and wait. And while you are waiting, you can join in the singing of communion songs together, which can be found 
listed in your bulletin. The numbers are printed there, and just follow Kristen's lead. And just so you also know, Chuck and Linda will come around the sanctuary for those who prefer to be served in the pews. So just raise your hand and they will form a circle with you. And if you are watching online, you will need your own elements and feel free to eat and drink as you feel led following along with one of the circles. When the hour had come, Jesus took his place at the table and the disciples with him. He said to them, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took a cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, which is poured out for you. And when you drink it, remember me, the gifts that you have given us. And these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So come, come forward, come to the table of grace. Number 476, eat this bread. We'll just stay seated. Number 461, come to the table of grace.
sing this story. Number 77, here is the bread, 77.
It's time to share with each other some of where we're at on our journey, some joys, perhaps some concerns, things we'd like to remember in prayer with each other. I'd like to begin with some brief announcements and then uh, give you a chance to, to uh, share if you'd like. The, as was mentioned, we celebrated the life of Gary Harder yesterday and we have some flowers here that uh, represent that service and that love. And so perhaps you could join me in saying thanks be to God for Gary Harder. Thanks be to God. We have a number of services coming up and I won't go through each one of them. You're going to have to plug a lot of these into your phone or write them on your calendar to keep it all straight. But we hope that you can feel uh, able to participate as, as your calendar allows. For, good, for um, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, an early community celebration on Easter Sunday at 7.30 on the steps of St. James Lutheran Church here in town. Uh, or come a little later for nine, finger food Easter breakfast here, and our service following at 10. There's a progressive supper happening this evening from starting at four, and so check your emails and notes on that. You've probably been well uh, versed on what is to come. We have a Easter choir rehearsal here after this service. Chuck has anticipated 50 or more of you coming, so <laughs> please feel confident that there will be music for you. Two pieces to work up. There'll be a worship response uh, opportunity downstairs for the two of us that won't be in the choir. <laughs> I'll be one of those. And then uh, also downstairs, Junior Sunday School is happening for grades three to eight. Marcia and Visual Arts Committee are inviting us to decorate the sanctuary with a splash of color for Easter Sunday. There will be two times that you could help with that by bringing flowers you may have available at home uh, to be used in the decorating. Thursday evening, if uh, you want to come to out before the Monday Thursday service, that would be an opportunity. Friday morning would also be one to bring your flowers. There won't be anybody here on Saturday for the, any flower drop off, so just pay attention to that. If you would label the bottom of your pot or vase and place your flowers in the library on the table and take them home after Easter Sunday service, that would be great. Are there any other announcements? Well, then let's recognize our tithes and gifts and offerings that come in many forms. We'll give thanks for them as the ushers bring them forward. Um, in fact, let, let's say right now, thanks be to God. Thank you, Stephanie, for your offertory. Chuck is prepared to bring the microphone around. If you would like to raise your hand and indicate if you'd have something you'd like us to celebrate with you or to remember in prayer. Yesterday was a wonderful day. <laughs> and uh, want to give thanks for all the support that was part of it. Uh, such a rich service of, of place to express our, our tears, so much laughter within it, um, uh, even if it wasn't Brian Mulroney's service. <laughs> <laughs> Janet made a great comment on that. Um, 
And, and just to be able to celebrate my dad's life with, with all of you in community here was, was so wonderful. Uh, I think Don's word of completeness and a sense of that, um, and even from the whole week, we, we, it was wonderful to have our uh, visitation time down in the basement uh, over a couple of days, um, to have space for um, my brother-in-law, Fred, to lead us uh, in a, a meal ceremony and, and uh, smudging and some parts at the, at the, uh, to drum us at, drum at the end. That was the last song after we sang Go Now in Peace and then for Fred to, to, to drum for Dad uh, as they lowered the grave. Just all those parts in our kind of wild, wacky family and all brought together was, was great. Um, and just wanted to thank um, all the different people that, that helped with things. I think about the facilities and, and Stu and Derek and Dave uh, helping with all of that and the social committee um, with, with Brenda and Andrea and Pauline and everyone else that helped with that. Um, Larry and, and Trevor and the sound and making those things work. And, um, and then in the, the service, uh, Kristen and Ashlyn and Chuck, uh, the music was so wonderful and kind of, I think it's still echoing a bit in here, uh, raising the roof. Um, uh, and then Michelle Rizzoli, who joined as pastor from, from Tumsey, and, and Don and Janet, uh, thank you so much for your words and shaping of things and, and the compassion and care through these weeks, through, through this month, and then for the service. Uh, and for uh, allowing me not to be a pastor at all this week uh, was just, just very special. So, so for me, just a, a real gratitude for, for this experience and, and no, I'll leave just this, and just all the people that came out in support uh, through this time. So, um, thanks be to God. Let's echo Mark. Thanks, thanks be to God. God. My name is Aki. Marcy and I were in the Southeast Asia uh, last uh, one and a half month, and we met many friends. Especially we found uh, people in Myanmar, used to be Burma, uh, are suffering, especially Shan states and Chim ethnic people are persecuted by the military authorities. Bombs are dropping many villages. Couple million people are lost the community and moving to, towards uh, Thailand to evacuate. And uh, we really need the prayer for those who lost community and the family and many people are dying right now. So please pray for them. Thank you. Let's, let's take a moment to pray. Lord, we're so grateful to have Aki and Marcy back from their many weeks of, of travel, and we give thanks for the opportunities that they had to reconnect with people they know, and perhaps even to make some new connections, new friendships. We want to take Aki's word and turn it into our word on behalf of those who have lost community, who have lost homes, who have lost family members and friends. Lord, reveal your power in this situation in our world that doesn't get as much attention these days on the news. We are in need of blessing them with mercy. And we join your Holy Spirit in connecting to their vulnerability and we ask that you would, in spite of everything and through everything, reveal yourself that you truly do care and that you will sustain and lead them in this time. We ask these things through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Anyone else? All right, I invite you to continue to pray with me.
Loving God, we bring ourselves before you with all of our thoughts and feelings, as hard as that sometimes is to be completely honest. Like a pair of coveralls we, with many pockets, there are lots of things that we carry in different places. In one pocket, there are a few candles, or pardon me, candies and coins, simple experiences from this past week that were sweet and that jingle about reminding us of things that went right. And we thank you for these moments of grace and goodness. Then there are a couple of pockets holding tissues, some crumpled up and well used from drying our eyes. Sad things have happened this week, things that reminded us of past hurts and losses. We've shed tears for people we love and care about that have been seriously ill, lonely, conflicted, and fearful. We feel their pain and we weep at what seems broken and unfixable. In another pocket, there are tissues that we've shed tears over the struggles and losses of, of our life. There have been points this week where we've been touched by frustration and grief that we didn't see coming and some we did not, or some that we did see coming but couldn't stop. Some people we love are dying and others have passed and it all feels very heavy. Lord, comfort us and all who are hurting. Transform our sadness into something good, but not until the gift of these tears is fully realized. May they help us cry out to you and leave our burdens in your good care. May we experience your presence in the midst of our sorrows and know your peace. Lord, we have a few pockets that are empty, waiting for you to fill. Some of us wait for employment, summer jobs or per permanent ones. Some of us wait for meaningful work. Some of us wait for validation and recognition in any form. Then there are those empty pockets waiting to be filled with forgiveness, healing, and a second chance. Lord, you know what it is we need. Show us what to do. If need be, help us turn that pocket inside out. If there is a hole, help us mend it. Give us courage to own our brokenness and to cooperate with your will. Creator God, we celebrate that you are rolling out your plans to establish the fullness of your kingdom with, where mercy, justice, hospitality, and equality define relationships. We thank you for the tools that we can carry in some of our pockets to participate in your work, be it needle and thread, or hammer and nail, paper and pen, keys and a driver's license, we each have something to help build a path and offer a welcome to the lost, the little, and the least. Show us where we can serve you this day. Wise and loving God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Even before a word comes to mind, you know it and invite us to trust you with it. We long to be in conversation with you to not only share what we're carrying, but to know your thoughts. And so we ask, fill us afresh with your spirit. May the fullness of your presence be our number one desire, displacing all our worries about not being good enough 
and all our temptations to be self-reliant. Continue the good work you have begun in us and grow this community, our church family, into one that acts justly, loves mercy, and walks humbly in the way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Number 810, in Voices Together, Go My Friends in Grace, let's stand to sing. May the beauty of God be reflected in our eyes, the love of God be reflected in our hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in our words, and the knowledge of God flow from our hearts. Amen. 